Andy, welcome. Hello, hello. Come How are you, in. man? I'm great. Good hey. to see you. Long, Hi. Long time coming. And friendly neighbors. Friendly neighbors. Welcome to my parents' home. Well, are you ready for your 73 questions? Andy, I was born ready. Let's get it. That sounds amazing. So let's start off. What is your name? My name is Jake Goodman, and I am a psychiatry resident doctor. And how many years into training are you? I am in my first year. I'm six Ooh. months in, five months in. Come on into this room. Um, this is my dad's guitar room. Absolutely um, beautiful. Yeah, I'm in my. I'm six months in, so I'm I'm relatively new, but I'm experiencing a lot. And caught you on a little bit of time off. Well deserved time off. Yeah, it's been a grind. Uh, any intern can tell you that the first couple of months are going to be brutal, but I'm so happy to finally be on vacation. Oh, let's continue. Where did you go to undergrad? University of Georgia, the number one football team in the country. Go dogs! <laughs> I haven't been able to say that in a while. Yep. I'm glad we can. Oh, that was, that was cold. That was cold. And hey, I'm dogs a Georgia fan a too. Oh, you are? Don't worry. Perfect. Um, and medical school. Medical school at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. Did you take any gap years before going to medical school? I did take a gap year. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to front and say it was like a planned gap year. I didn't get into any of the medical schools that I applied to my first year. I got denied by 25 medical schools. That gap year was forced, and during that gap year, I did so many different things that helped me prepare to be a doctor, as well as so many different things like drive Uber, work as a waiter, uh, work as a bartender, things that prepared me to um, learn people skills and stuff like that. Things that medical school doesn't exactly teach you. No, not at all. So, medical school wasn't too long ago for you. So what would you say is your favorite part about medical school? Favorite part about medical school? Um, getting in and finishing. <laughs> medical school is brutal and, and I will not um, lie to anybody watching this. Medical school is really, really, really difficult. I enjoyed a lot of things in it, but I'm very happy to be done. Well said. So what specialty did you think you were gonna go into on your first day of medical school? Whew. All right. I thought about pediatrics. I thought about ophthalmology. I worked as an ophthalmology technician in my, in my gap year. Um, I, I dabbled plastic surgery, and then ultimately I found psychiatry. So what changed your mind about those other specialties? Well, I think when you come into medical school, you have a certain idea of what you want to do. Um, and some of that was based on things like, oh, plastic surgery sounds really cool, make a lot of money, operate on people. But then you get in there and you get in the, in the OR and you get screamed at by some surgeons and you start shaking and you ask the resident, hey, hey man, how many hours a week do you work? And he's like, 110. And then you're like, you know, maybe I want to do something else with my life. And then I found psychiatry. And psychiatry, if you want to talk about work-life balance, which is my life, Psychiatry is one of the best fields for that. Well, we'll hint on that later in the interview. <laughs> so speaking of, you know, what you came in thinking, were there any specialties you came in out the door said, absolutely not for me? Ooh. <laughs> OBGYN. Uh, OBGYN is, is a, I have the utmost respect for the uh, obstetrics and gynecology folk, but... <laughs> Once you're in the room and um, you're, you're getting screamed, get out of here, who are you? And I'm the med student just like trying to help out with delivering the baby. Just seeing the high stress, the high acuity, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. All right, well, let's get back to what was for you. So what first made you fall in love with psychiatry? Oh, I wasn't going, you know, I wasn't, in, I wasn't going to medical school with the idea of becoming a psychiatrist. It actually was one of the things I probably had the lowest on my list. I had a couple experiences early on in, in college particularly that exposed me to, to mental health. Unfortunately, a friend of mine passed away in college from suicide and I saw mental health, the, the impact of untreated mental health and, and the worst case scenario of what can happen. That was like exposure number one. At that point, I still wasn't necessarily gung-ho about psych, but once I got into medical school, 
I started seeing, I was in my psychiatry rotation. I saw people, you know, come into the clinic maybe six weeks ago, they, their mental illness was so bad that they were, they were homeless. They didn't have a job. Now they're back in treatment. They're back on medications. They're in therapy they're, They got their job back. They're living this amazing life again because their mental health is now being treated. I saw that with the combination of what happened to my friend in college and now I'm seeing this in medical school, I was, I was sold. Plus the, the work-life balance was really nice because in medical school you're exposed to all these different specialties. I saw what a psychiatrist's life was like and I was in. So for those who want to be in your shoes one day, which uh, by the way, on my channel, it's a lot. I'm telling you, psychiatry has been the most requested specialty. Love it. How long does your training take after medical school? It's four years. Um, four years. You can do a fellowship. The fellowships are one year. Addiction, uh, addiction psychiatry is one of them. Um, you can do forensics. You can do child. Um, and you can do maybe one more that I'm, I'm forgetting. But um, most psychiatrists, I say, don't end up doing a fellowship. Some do, some don't. Um, I'm planning on not doing a fellowship and just doing my four years. Okay. So... That answered my next question, so good job. <laughs> and we noticed you got an MBA from the great University of Georgia. Let's go. So how has having an MBA impacted the way you view patient care? Oh, good question. So before the MBA, you think to yourself like, okay, here's a patient. Um, what medication do they need? Let's say they need this antidepressant or this antipsychotic you're not thinking how much does this medication cost, right? You're just thinking like, this is probably the best medication for the patient. But once you get your MBA and you learn about business and you learn like this medication right here, this, this long acting injectable is $1,000 per injection. But this one over here, their insurance will cover and it's $9 per injection. This is just an example, of course. And you start to, you start to bring that into your, to your patient care. So it's like, I, this patient cannot afford this medication. I'm not going to prescribe this medication or recommend it. So it gives you kind of a full picture. It also gives you business skills because you have to think to yourself, what do you want to do with your life? Yes, you want to be a cardiologist. You want to be a psychiatrist. But what do you want your life to be like? For me, in my life, I want to run my own business. I want to run my own practice. I need to know how to do accounting, finance. I, know how to, I need to know how to do all that kind of stuff. And an MBA taught me a ton of those skills. Well said. And a great selling point to those considering dual degrees. Now, what would you say is the most unique part of your specialty of psychiatry? Unique part, hmm. Okay, I think it's really cool that you get people at their rock bottom, especially in an inpatient setting, right? These, these people are at the lowest point they've ever been in their life. They may be the most depressed, the most anxious, they may be suicidal, they may be really just struggling in, in ways that they've never told anybody. And they come to you and they tell you things that they've never told anyone on earth. That they have been thinking of ending their life, that they've been thinking of hurting somebody else, that they've been on this drug and this drug is ruining their life. And they're sharing with this, this information to you, vulnerable information. And you have the power to change their life and say, let's, let's get you on some medication or let's get you into some therapy and let's, let's change the course of your life. So I always give people the chance to sell their specialty like a car salesman. So uh, let's, let's head upstairs. Yeah, let's do it. Absolutely. Okay. I'm not going to sell psych because psych is not like, it's not for everybody. It's, there are many people that come to medical school they want to do surgery, they want to go in the OR. Psych is not for you if that's what you want. You need to decide if you want to be operating or you want to be in more like a clinic setting. I got in the OR, like I said, and it was miserable. Miserable. It wasn't for me. Um, I don't like being cold. I don't like holding my pee. I, I, I like having my own office where patients come to see me and I help them. Um, so you got to decide if you want to do like OR surgery type stuff or something else. For me, it was something else. Then psychiatry allows you, if you want to do outpatient like me, how, you know, what would it cost to start a business? Do I need to go buy surgical equipment? Do I need to, you know, I don't, these days with, with telepsychiatry and, um, you know, I could work from my own home. I could see people and help them with their mental health. I could prescribe over, you know, 
I don't have to go in person and prescribe and give them medication. It's all remote. I found that psychiatry was this perfect blend of interesting medicine, constantly evolving, as well as I can run a business and I can kind of control my own hours. So it's a kind of mixture of passion and, and business for me. Now, flip it around, be the devil's advocate. Why should someone not choose your specialty? It's not for everybody. If you are not passionate about mental health and you don't really want to see people at their rock bottom, I wouldn't go into psychiatry. Uh, you're going to be exposed to really difficult stuff that you've maybe not been exposed to before. How do you tell somebody that, you know, you might need to stay in the hospital, even though you don't want to, you might need to stay in the hospital for a few days and uh, get stabilized because I, I don't believe that you're going to be able to be on your own out there because your life is in danger or somebody else is in danger. And you have to, you have to really have these powerful conversations with people who may not want to hear these conversations. So if you can, if you can be vulnerable and if people are always coming to you like, Hey, I'm having a breakup. What should I do? That's a sign that you might be made for psychiatry. Well said. So fun question. Are there any stereotypes about your specialty? Oh yeah, there's plenty of stereotypes. It's my plants here. I just want to expose my, my fig leaf. Uh, this is actually my mom's plants, but, um, yeah, there's like, you know, what do you think of when you think of a psychiatrist? For me, it's like growing up, it was like um, the old white guy with white hair, you know, and then the patient's lying on the bed and they're like, so tell me how that makes you feel. And they're like writing in their journal. And it's truly not like that anymore. Maybe like in the early 1900s, but it's not like that anymore. Psychiatry is a field where you can do, there's so many ways you can go. You can do forensics, you can go and work in legal cases, work with lawyers, you can work in addiction. We all know the epidemic of, of addiction in this country. You can do outpatient, inpatient. It's really the mo one of the most versatile fields. Okay, well, next question is, are any of the stereotypes true? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, definitely true. I think, like I, you know, we hang out, I me and my psychiatry friends hang out, right? And it's like, we're very open about our mental health. And um, one of the stereotypes is that like psychiatrists are kind of like, um, they're like psychoanalyze you, right? Or they're like, they, but when we talk, it's like, you know, we're really like, you might be depressed with what you're going through. And is that something to do with how you've been raised? Or, you know, like, we kind of like, we kind of go down those paths a little bit. And some people are not comfortable with those type of conversations. Okay. All right. You do work in an academic hospital. Yes. So do you get to interact with medical students at all? A hundred percent. I love working with med students. So with that in mind, what is your favorite question to ask them on the wards? Oh man. Not me trying to prepare for my psych rotation. I'm actually like one of the nicest residents to work with because I know what it's like. I was a med student at a particularly demanding academic institution. I know what it's like to get pimped every single day. Pimped, for those of you that don't know, is basically getting asked a question and then getting humiliated in front of others for not knowing. Uh, so I know what it's like. So with my med students, I don't even like to use the term my med students because I always hated that when I was a med student. I'm like, I'm not your med student. With the med students that I work with, I actually just teach them how to survive in the hospital. Not just how to, you know, what psychiatry questions they should know for their shelf, but like, this is how you do a presentation. This is how, um, these are where all the bathrooms are that you need to know about the because essentials. the essentials, because you might be rounding and you got to go real quick. Here's how you, here's how you call a consult so that your first consult, you call the gen surge or ortho, you don't get just completely destroyed on the phone. But I'd say like some questions I ask about, um, if I am going to test their knowledge, pharmacology, half of psychiatry or more is pharmacology, side effects of medications and stuff like that. Okay. So oh, speak of pimping or you ask questions, what's the craziest question you've been pimped on as a student or, well, I guess even as a resident? Let me just, uh, <laughs> I have uh -oh, to go I'm back. <laughs> I, I suppressed, I suppressed all of this, y'all. I suppressed all of the, of the pimping, um, humiliation. I, I'm really making med school out to be like worse than it is. Um, oh yeah. 
Name the <laughs> name the three corners of the inguinal canal. Um, no, wait, wait. name the roof of the inguinal canal. I think it's the uh, internal. Oh, no, the uh, external. He doesn't even know the roof of the inguinal canal. Those are the kind of situations um, that you have to suppress in medical school. By the way, the roof of the inguinal canal, Andy, do you know? I knew it at one point. I'm, I'm getting there. Someone throw it in the comments. I think it's external <laughs> oblique aponeurosis. I could be oh completely wrong. God. To be honest, I never knew. The, that was definitely over six to seven months for me, so. Okay. Okay, let's go back to that so I don't have to answer that question. <laughs> This is me interviewing you, not the other way around. <laughs> so, are you ever nervous at all coming onto your shifts? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so some part of my job is I work in the psychiatric emergency room. Um, it's high acuity. You never know what you're going to see. You could see people, you know, it's not unheard of to see someone come in on very intoxicated from drugs. You know, you just, you never know what you're going to see. And you got to come in prepared every day and you don't know what to prepare for. So yes, the first couple months I was nervous every single day. Now I'm nervous like 40% of the days. And I hope that by second year I'm nervous like 20% and it just continues to go down. But I'm always nervous. I don't want to make it seem like I'm not because it's residency is really scary. Well said. Very open as well. So we got some quick fire questions, more on the lifestyle of okay. a psychiatrist since you uh, really were selling that. Uh, how many patients do you see on an average day? Good question. Uh, I'd say 10 on average. Uh, it depends if I'm working in the ER or in the inpatient unit. In the inpatient unit, I'd say 10 is pretty standard. Um, could be plus or minus three. In the psychiatric emergency room, I mean, it's a free for all. Some, some days, three. You know, some days people aren't coming in, but some days, 15. Right. Like it, it really depends. And that was a huge learning curve because in medical school, it's not, you know, you get one or two patients residency, all of a sudden you're seeing a lot. So with that, what's the most amount of patients you've ever seen in a day? I think like 15, 15 in, in the ER. And I, I was, that was a really tough day for me. Oh, really tough question. Okay. But I'm curious to know the answer. What has been the most challenging part of transitioning from a medical student to a new psychiatrist? Because you are in your intern year. Yeah. Look, no matter where you do your intern year or what you do your intern year in, that year is going to be probably the hardest of your life. I got on social media to make it, to make people realize, to help people realize the whole spectrum of medicine, that it wasn't this fairy tale, great profession where you just have fun and see patients and save lives. There's a lot of negatives that come with it. Intern year is really, really difficult. The mo most hours you've ever worked in your life, the most stress you've been under. And that transition has been really brutal, really brutal. I started seeing a therapist because of the stress that I was experiencing in my residency. I've had to come to terms with my own mental health because you got to take care of yourself if you are going to be in this field especially in the mental health field. So that, that transition has been really brutal and now I'm pretty, in a pretty good place with it. I have a good you know, social support system and um, you know, my fiance is in, in medicine as well. She's an internal medicine resident. And then I'm also seeking help you know, from the mental health community and I'm in a pretty good spot now. Okay. So more on kind of the hours, how many hours do you work in an average week? Uh, you know, it depends. It really does depend. I'd say like 60, it could maybe average. There are more and there's less. Sometimes I'm on call multiple times in a week and that's gonna be pushing 70, it could be more, which is actually less than a lot of other specialties. Uh, I, you know, I'm sure you've, I, I saw some of the gen surge, 73 questions, the anesthesia. I'm sure their, their hours might be a little bit more, which is a selling point for psychiatry. Less hours meaning more time outside the hospital, which is very important. Yeah. Uh, also very important. We got some sleep questions here. Okay. What time do you normally wake up? 5.30? <laughs> 6? 
Um, by the way, do you want anything to drink? Water? Uh, I'll LaCroix? take water. Okay. Just regular water? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to get myself some sparkling water. I probably wake up at 5.30 or 6. Uh, today, for example, I woke up at 8, which is the, the beauty of not the beauty of being on vacation. In a perfect world, you know, I'm waking up at 7. Uh, I'm going to sleep at 11. But in residency, you got to make some changes. And if you got to get in at 7.30 or 7 or 6, you got to wake up early. So these days, 5.36. Yeah. What time do you normally leave the hospital? Uh, 4.30 on average. So you can do the math. I mean, it's, it's totally manageable. It's totally manageable. And there are many residency programs where people will stay 10 o'clock at night. Like, that's not unheard of. Okay. And there are times when I have to do that as well. But um, 4.35 on average. How many hours of sleep are you typically working on? In medical school, it was eight. In medical school, I was like, you know, if you're not getting eight hours of sleep, you know, you're not living. These days, I'm like, yeah, six, like six and a half, you know. And that's, you have to do what you got to do. And for me, like, I like doing things outside of the hospital. I can't just sleep and work. You know, I do other things. And so six is good, but my goal is to be at seven. So when we talk in a couple of months, I hope I say seven. <laughs> Hey, six is uh, actually one of the better numbers I've heard from residents. So. Oh, I'm sure you've heard four and a half, five. Yeah. Uh, how many hours of sleep are you working on right now? I'm well rested. Eight? Uh, yeah. It's your time off. Yeah, eight. Probably eight. Oh, you mentioned this earlier, earlier, but do you have to take call? Yeah. I do have to take call. Call is a, is a, is a misnomer. I want to... I wanna, um, I want to get some misinformation out of here right now. When I heard call when I was a medical student, I'm like, oh, no problem. You know, you just like have this phone and you're just chilling, watching Netflix. And every once in a while, it's like, hey, yeah, like just increase the lisinopril. <laughs> that is not call. Call, for the most part, is additional hours worked. It's, you know, you're in the hospital seeing patients consistently. There are times, I think, later in your career where call is kind of just chilling and waiting and but I think especially as an intern in your first year, call is like, you're grinding, you're working, you're working additional hours and you're seeing people at night when there's less people in the hospital, which is very scary. Let's go maybe outside here. It's a beautiful day in Georgia. Sure. I'm from the South and I hope to always live in a warm place. Hey, Georgia is looking pretty beautiful about now. Look at this. <laughs> Oh, all right. Are you a night or day shift person? Oh, I'm a day shift. I did, I did a month of nights recently. It was probably the worst month of my life. It was so bad. Uh, I like routine. I like waking up and seeing the sun and being outside and working all night long, not getting any vitamin D from the sun, not seeing your friends, no one's texting you at 4 a.m. because they're asleep. It was really, really hard. I have to do it one more time in my academic career. Then I pledge to never do nights again. Good. Probably a good decision. <laughs> so, always an interesting question because I get variations depending on the specialty. Okay. How long does it take you to chart at the end of your day? Four hours. Wow. My goal is to be at three. And I know people that can do it faster. And it also depends. If you're on, a, if you're on an inpatient unit where you have 10 patients, I mean, you've got to write 10 notes. And those are 10, especially if you have new patients, those are initial notes. They take a long time. Uh, you know, my weakness is I'm, I'm a slow typer. So if I could go back in time, I would learn to type faster. I, and in, in sixth grade, when we were doing typing class, I was playing Halo. We were, we were like, you know, those kids. And I wish I would have paid attention to that class. But four hours now, Next time we talk, I hope it's three. Okay. Oh, wholesome question. Yeah. Who are you most thankful for on your care team? Tex. So in, in, in psych, especially in the emergency room, it, could be, it can get, you know, it's high acuity, right? You, you may need somebody to um, protect you. As the doctor, you're very, you can be very vulnerable, very vulnerable, you know? So... Techs can 
you know, they're trained in, as most of us are trained, but they are particularly trained in how to um, kind of reduce the hostility, how to, if it ever gets to the point where um, it's a physical altercation, they are trained to, in the most safe way, protect the patient uh, and protect the physician and the nurses. So I, I love working with techs. So next question, and I'm curious to hear what you say, especially okay. in your field. What's the most rewarding patient experience you have come across so far? Ooh, this is good. We're gonna get deep here. Oh boy. Man, I mean, I've had, I've had so many, so many. Um, I think working with kids, you know, these are kids who maybe they don't have, their, their parents may not be a part of their life and they may not have the social support. They may not be in the best schools. They may have never even spoken to a doctor before and now they're in the inpatient unit and it's my job to get them to trust me. And all they know about psychiatrists is what they see in TV and seeing cartoons and stuff. I'm, that's not me. I sit down at their level I get to know them. They they know I'm just an older version of them. Like I'm I'm a kid at the end of the day. Like I'm I'm 29. I was not so long ago in their shoes. I get them to trust me. I get them to open up. I help them. I I, I give them advice on how they can improve their lives, how they can get out of the situation that they're in. And that's like the most um it gives me the most satisfaction to see these kids who are at their rock bottom, turn their lives around, get, seek treatment, get help. Because most kids, at least in my generation, in our generation, would like, we're mm -hmm. not, you know, mental health, I don't need that. But these are kids that are like more open to it. This generation, this new generation is more open to it. And to get them to trust me is like the best feeling. That's amazing. Now, for those who don't know, uh, you do a lot of social media mental health advocacy uh, through yes. TikTok, Instagram, etc. So, how has your advocacy for mental health on social media impacted the way you care for patients? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I... I kind of realized early on that mental health was taboo, right? We all kind of know that it's changing, but it's not cool to talk about your mental health. At least it wasn't five years ago. And now, I'm just closing this door. And now it's becoming more cool to talk about. Michael Phelps opens up about his mental health. Um, Naomi Osaka drops out of the uh, French Open, I believe because of her mental health. Now it's starting to be cool and accepted and normal to, to, to open up about your mental health. That resonated with people on social media. That's how I've been able to build the platform that I have, is that I want others to know that it's okay, it's normal, it's, it's okay. It's not your fault that you have depression and it's not gonna be forever. And I take that with me into the patient encounters that I have you know, sometimes people apologize, like, I'm so sorry, like, I'm, I'm dealing with this, like, I'm so sorry you have to, like, do, you know, see me like this. I'm like, don't apologize. It's not your fault. It's, not, it's just like it's not your fault if you have cancer. You know, it happened. It's now let's get to the bottom of it and let's treat it. And that's been really cool, both on social media and with patients in real life. Equally incredible answer. Thank you. So, uh, what is the most common medical advice you give to your patients? So much of mental health treatment is outside of medication, even outside of therapy. So much of mental health can be treated by changes in your sleep, in your, in your, in your food that you consume, in breathing. I started, I started meditating five years ago I do it every day. I do 10 minutes a day. Um, just that time where I'm like focusing on my breath and I, I am able to, to displace all of the stressors in my life has improved my mental health so much. 
there are so many things that you can do. And I, I, I tell people about mindfulness meditation, about you know, how many hours of sleep are you getting? If it's four, let's try to get it to six. And are you eating you know, a hamburger and fries every meal? But let's try adding in some fruit and some veggies. So I think that's one thing I always try to teach is it's not just about an antidepressant and therapy. It's a whole sphere, a whole spectrum of treatment. All right, and now to kind of wrap up the medical side of things, what is your favorite nerdy random medical fact? Ooh, that's good. That's good. Um, as I think, I'm going to sit. That's really good. Um, okay. <laughs> there is a um, specific, I don't know if it's a mental health issue, it's a disorder. It's called can uh, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. Cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. For some people that consume cannabis, they vomit profusely. Um, one of the treatments, um, I wouldn't necessarily call it a treatment, but one of the ways to reduce the vomiting is, I don't know if you know this, Andy, this is, this is a... I feel like I remember it being mentioned, but more as just like a fun little trivia fact. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what it is? No, I don't Hot remember. showers. Oh, Hot yeah, showers. that's right. I, you know, I think it does something, the, the heat does something with um, maybe some IgE. I'm not quite sure, but it's just like a cool trivia fact that like sometimes patients will say to you, every time I use this stuff, I throw up and then I take a hot shower and I feel better. It's just a really cool trivia fact. All right. Well, we've talked a lot about your life inside the hospital and about your life as a physician. So how about your life when you clock out? So what is your favorite thing to do when you are not working? I love life. I love life outside the hospital. And I think everyone that's watching this needs to think to themselves, what do you want to do when you're outside the hospital? What do you want your life to be like? What do you want? That's like the biggest takeaway here is like, what do you want your life to be like after residency? For me, I love being outside. I love running. I just traveled to Breckenridge. I love hiking, swimming, being outside, plants. This isn't my house, this is my parents' house, but my house in Miami, I've got like 30 plants. I love life outside of the hospital and I wanna spend as much time as I can with my family, with my plants, with my two dogs. And that is one of the most important things to think about when you're choosing a specialty. Are you gonna be able to do those things that you love outside the hospital? And not just for 10 minutes a day, but really, can you do, I just went for an hour run before this, because I have the time. Yes, I'm on vacation, but psychiatry gives you that time. So I'm kind of selling psych without even meaning to, but <laughs> think about it. I'm sure there's a lot of people that are absolutely enjoying you selling psych right now. <laughs> uh, so d you mentioned you're at your parents' house. Yes. Does your family ever ask you for random medical advice? Oh yeah, yeah. And my friends. Uh, <laughs> What's the weirdest question you've ever been asked? <laughs> I can't incriminate anybody, but you could kind of like guess, you know, we have, we have smartphones, people take pictures of things, you know, there's a sort of fear about uh, like rashes, right? Like on certain areas. And, you know, I just say like, you know, I give like a general, like, you know, I would probably go to your primary care doc or like, you're probably good, but you might want to get it checked out. Or like, dude, go right now to the ER. <laughs> I just give like kind of general advice, right? Yep, that's the safe way. Oh, favorite animal, not a dog or a cat? Bearded dragon. I had a bearded dragon in, uh, in high school. Bearded dragons are like, uh, they're like these big lizards, like iguana-esque. And they have like this big puff like beard. That's why they're called bearded dragons. They're dope. This is the first time anyone has ever said that. So that's cool. <laughs> Uh, any artistic hobbies you keep up with? I create content on social media. I think that's an art. I think you'd agree. There's definitely a, there's an art to it. There's a storytelling component to it. I try to elicit an emotion when I create TikTok videos or Instagram reels or stuff like that. Um, I play guitar, you know, and I watch Netflix. Is that, is that, a, is that an art? That is 100% an art. <laughs> My next question is how long have you been doing it? I will exclude the Netflix one from the answer. <laughs> sure. I mean, I've been playing guitar since I was like eight. Like my dad is a guitar teacher. He's teaching a lesson right now. Um, 
And I've been playing with plants for a while, but I didn't get passionate about it really until um, probably like this year, like this year, COVID, I, start, I needed a passion. And I started growing. I started from seed. I grew herbs. And um, man, one, I'll send you a picture one day of my, of my house in Miami because I have a whole vertical garden. It's beautiful. Yeah, the pride and joy. Um, let's see. If you could have dinner with anyone in history, who would it be? Mac Miller. What would you guys be eating at that dinner? Sushi. Is that your favorite dish to eat? I love sushi. I, 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 got, I went too deep in the sushi world though. You know, I started dabbling with things that were like way too exotic. And then I kind of got sick one day. And I had an aversion. I had an aversion to my favorite food for like six months. I took a break. I took some time off to rest and recuperate. And then I came back. And I just stick with the basics these days. Spicy tuna, spicy salmon, just the classics. Coffee, tea, or soda? Tea. I quit mm. soda like 10 years ago, and I quit coffee two years ago. I have not had an ounce, not a drop of coffee in two years. That's impressive. I wish I could say the same. It's hard. It's hard. But tea, there's something about tea. Oh. Good. How much water should you be drinking every day? I drink way too much water. And, and seriously, that was the reason why I couldn't uh, become a surgeon. I have to pee like every 90 minutes. I actually wake up every night to pee. Some people would say that's a problem. I've, I've gone to the doctors, I've got it checked out. Thank you very much, people that are concerned about me. I drink a lot of water. I can't tell you what to drink. I think let your pee tell you. If your pee is consistently brown and smelly, you might not be drinking enough water. If, you're, if your pee is consistently clear, looks like water like mine, you might be drinking too much water. So find what works for you. Balance is a key. Yes. Oh, favorite meal from the hospital cafeteria, if you have one. Sushi, sushi. I didn't mean okay. to talk about sushi so much in this interview, but uh, sushi, we have these two sushi chefs that just crush it. So I do like once a week. Okay. Oh, what is one thing you would say you are oddly good at? Oh, that's a great question, Andy. Oddly good at? Um, freestyle rapping. Oh. <laughs> That's new. Learn, <laughs> learn something, something new every single day. Yeah, I'm a natural. Uh, My album's is... dropping next month. Ooh. Stay tuned. Okay, surprise announcement. What is one task you'd say you would wish you were better at? One task I was better at. I said typing earlier, so I'll do something else. Um, directions. I don't know if it's really a task, but like, I think I was born without the area of my brain that's responsible for directions. If you were to tell me to go to Atlanta, I lived in Georgia for 20 plus years. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you, I have no idea. I think I, I, that part of my brain was outsourced and this phone, kind of the GPS for my phone took over that area of my brain. So I have no idea, directions are impossible for me. All right, probably the most controversial question on this entire list. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Oh yeah, it's fire. Okay. Favorite TikTok sound at the moment? Uh, to be honest, I've been kind of off TikTok for a while, like a week or so, just trying to like decompress. Um, man, that probably like the, <laughs> I'm gonna butcher it, but it's like, oh, 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 the stallion. <laughs> Good choice. Like, somebody knows what I'm talking about, I hope. I know what you're talking about, but that means I spend too much time on TikTok. <laughs> uh, did you ever think you would hit the numbers you have on TikTok? No, no. I'm gonna move my chair over here. Uh, no, no. I, I kind of had like a goal, like you know, like a kind of goal when I started on social media. Like, you know, it would be cool if I hit 3,000 followers. I remember thinking that. Like, it would be cool. Like, 3,000 like be a pretty big number. And today it's 1.5 million. I never thought, I swear, I never thought it would be anywhere close to this, but I just tried and then tried again and then failed and then tried and then and ultimately just figured it out. Yeah, I think it's a true testament to perseverance for sure. Yeah, thank you, man. Anybody that's on social media can agree. Mm -hmm. uh, your top three music artists. Oh, 
Um, let's see. Well, Mac. So Mac, like Mac Miller is my guy from since I was 14, maybe even earlier. Like I wanted to be Mac Miller. Mac Miller was everything to me. I, his career and the way, the way the music he made, especially towards the end of his life, incredible. So Mac's always my number one. Yay. The artist formerly known as Kanye. Um, and I mean, it's so like mainstream now, but Drake, but I've been riding with Drake since, since wheelchair Jimmy and Degrassi. So for you, for those of you watching that are like, oh, he's just a Drake stan. Like, yeah, I've been riding for, with Drake from day one. All right. <laughs> one song you could recommend anyone to listen to before they die. 2009 by Mac Miller. Fantastic song. Uh, what's the best way that you relax after a long day? Oh, uh, I try to work out. I try to work out, but there are some days you can't work out. You're so exhausted. It's like, that's not, that's like something I've had to learn. It's like that run, that, that lift when you're already exhausted, it's not going to, it's not going to work for you. You got to take a day off sometimes. Um, for someone like me, that's just so type A and like I, I work out every day, just like lounging and watching Shit's Creek has been my newest thing. I'm on season three. I'm really enjoying it. Hmm. And are you a night in or go out in the town kind of person? In college, I was go out. I was go out all the time. I don't know what this is. This is, this is the new dance move that the kids <laughs> are doing. Uh, but these days, I, I love staying in. I've, I've converted into an introvert, I believe. I just, I love familiarity, my own bathroom, water right there, my fiance, couch. Life is good. You know, I don't need to go to bars. I, don't get me wrong. I still love to, like, have fun and go out and stuff like that. But these days, 90% of the time, I'm staying in. Indoors or outdoors? I just said I, I love to stay in, but the answer for that question is actually outdoors, yeah. as we are here. This combines the best of both worlds, outside in my own home. Exactly. My parents' home. Beach or mountains? Beach. Beach. The cold is horrible. That... <laughs> For those of you watching that are that are pursuing medical school or residency, keep that in mind. Do you want to be in a place that is so cold that if you got locked out of your home one day, you would die in the night. You would freeze to death. Not me. I'm in Miami. I've been trying to get to Miami for 20 years, and now I live five minutes from the beach, and life is good. You're in the right place for someone who likes the beach. Yeah. And Would you consider yourself more of an introvert or an extrovert? So I was an extrovert. You have to be an extrovert to survive in America, I believe. Not really. But, you know, to be, to, you, you, you need to learn extroverted skills to be able to climb your way up in business or medicine or something like that. Like, you, you have to be able to interact with people and be um, sometimes more personable than you might be if you were truly an introvert. But as I've grown in life and accomplished the things I want to accomplish and, and see where I want to take things in the future, I'm... I think naturally I've always been an introvert and had to adjust to be extroverted. And now I'm kind of coming back into what makes me comfortable, which is chilling and being an introvert. Well, would you say that personality trait was a factor of you choosing your specialty? Good question. I mean, I never really thought about it like that, but maybe, maybe. I think, you know, Emergency medicine would be the prime, like, extroverted specialty, right? Like, they are out there every day seeing people, high acuity, high acuity, teamwork type of thing. Um, psychiatry has components of that, but it also has the laid-back, one-on-one, so how are you type of thing. And I think I kind of gravitated towards that. All right. Well, we only have a few more questions left, but okay. these are probably the most important and impactful ones because okay. they're pretty reflective. Amazing. So, first question... What did you think you were going to be when you grew up as a kid? I always knew I was going to be a doctor. I always knew from when I was five years old that I wanted to be a doctor. I knew when I had been rejected for every med school I ever applied to that I was going to be a doctor. I knew when I was driving Uber, you know, making enough money to apply again that I was going to be a doctor. When I was taking the MCAT the second time, when the MCAT changed from the old MCAT to the new MCAT, I knew I was going to be a doctor. No matter what, after all the failures, I always knew that I was going to be a doctor, and I'm a doctor. 
Is there a different specialty you think you could have done? I could have done family medicine. I could have done... That's it. Okay. Short <laughs> Psych list. and family. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Now, if you didn't do medicine at all, what do you think you'd be doing right now? Like right now? Like I, I leave yes. medicine right now? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, like kind of before? Like, yeah. Like the whole doctor thing just yeah. never happened and never was a part of your life. What do you sure. think you'd be doing right now? I think I'd do something in business. I'd start my own company. I started my own company before. I know what it takes. Um, I, I just have gravitated towards and always loved like autonomy. Like I've all, I think I had, I think I grew up with like uh, oppositional defiant disorder and didn't really know it at the time because I have always had issues with authority, especially if that authority figure is someone I don't respect. And so I always dreamed of being in a profession or a career or a job in which I didn't have to clock in and report to a boss. I wanted to be the boss. And now I'm years away, a few years away from controlling everything in my life and being my own boss. And that's one of the coolest feelings in the world. Well said. And now this one you kind of hinted at earlier in the interview. Were there any times you doubted you would make it as a doctor? You know, I said earlier that I always knew I was going to be a doctor, despite all, despite it all, I always knew. But there's always doubt. There's always doubt. And it's like the other side was like the, no, you got this. You're going to do this no matter what. And they always competed with each other. I'd be lying to you if, if that doubt wasn't there. There was always doubt. There's doubt when, you know, someone comes up to you and they're like, I thought you were, pre I thought you were going to medical school. And what are you doing now? And I'm working in the restaurant and I'm, I'm their waiter. You know, like there's doubt there. There's always doubt. But eventually the doubt just starts to shrink because you just, you, you start making moves. You take the MCAT, you do well, you get good grades, you meet people, you network, you get the interview. The doubt just starts shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. It comes back. It comes back. That's what imposter syndrome is. It came back when I started residency, but it'll shrink back again. And ultimately just kind of shrivel up once you've accomplished all the things you've set out to accomplish. Now, if you could change one thing about the medical field right now, what would it be? <laughs> this is what my entire account is based off of. This is where I want to take my social media in the future. There are so many things, so many things wrong with the medical field. And there will be an additional 30-minute YouTube video we'd have to do. So I'll just keep it real short. Uh, finances. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be $300,000 to go to medical school. It shouldn't be $300,000. It should be attainable for the average American. It should be attainable for the person at the lowest socioeconomic status. Why is it so difficult for them to get a loan, for them to, to pay $300,000 to, to go to school? Tuition continues to increase. Fifty, fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year? You're selling your soul for that. You're going in massive debt for that. I took that risk, I took that chance because I know I'll pay it back, but it shouldn't be like that. Agreed. Now, what can a medical student do right now to prepare to go into your specialty? Into psychiatry? Don't worry so much. You don't need, you don't need a lot of research. You know, I, I, there was a time in my life where I wanted to do ophthalmology. I was grinding on research, on Excel. You know, I don't even know what I was doing. I was just trying to get the publications right. But like, I'm at a point now where I look back and I didn't do any psychiatry research zero. I'm at the program of my dreams. You know, do what you like to do. Andy does YouTube. I, I do TikTok and Instagram. You might like to sew. You might like to compete in swimming competitions or plant or whatever, you know, grow plants, garden. Do that. Make sure you get good grades. Get your scores where they need to be. Matters a little bit less now, I think, than it used to be with step one, going past fail, etc. That's a conversation for another day. But do the things you like to do and just become a well-rounded applicant. And when it comes time to interview, network your butt off. Now, if you were to go back, would you change any of your experiences that got you where you are right now? No. I think that's the safe answer for literally every physician I've interviewed. And I think that says something. Sure. And I, the mistakes I made, I'm glad I made them.
Like, you know, that's how you learn. Like, that's how you really learn. That, that's how you cement knowledge for 10, 20 years. It's like, oh, I made that mistake, and that mistake cost me a year of matriculation into medical school. I could have started a year earlier if I knew that, but I still wouldn't trade it. All right. Well, last question. Yeah. 73. Ready? Yeah. What would you say to the aspiring psychiatrist right now? That's a great question. Protect your mental health. Protect your mental health at all costs. If that means stepping away from something for a little bit, if that means letting someone down, if that means not going out to some party or some vacation or something, because you need to protect your mental health, do it. That, protecting your mental health, in my opinion, is like number one priority. This doesn't even go for people that are just interested in psychiatry, but especially for these people, because you're gonna be in a field where you're dealing with some of the most traumatic experiences in all of medicine. Medicine is a traumatic field, but psychiatry in particular is so traumatic. You gotta protect yourself or you won't be able to protect anybody else. Excellent words and a fitting ending to this. Uh, this has been a pretty lengthy one, but it's been worth every single minute. So thank you so much, Jake. And um, I, I hope someone out there is listening. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it.